And we're live. This is what um, it's what I hear anyway. This is now Bridge to a Better World. I'm Teresius. This is Zani Raven. Thanks for joining us. We have headlines to start with today. Trump appointed Postmaster Postmaster General Louis DeJoy, famous for destroying postal sorting machines and even mailboxes, to try to steal the presidential election for his patron, is under investigation by the FBI for allegedly illegally bundling contributions to GOP campaigns. The complaint is essentially that DeJoy pressured his employees to attend Republican events and to donate, and then kicked back the cash via bonuses that were not otherwise available a sneaky way for him to donate through his employees. The campaign squeeze allegedly took place at New Breed Logistics in North Carolina, where DeJoy was CEO until his appointment to lead the Postal Service. Uh, Radio Havana Cuba reports from Dublin that the Irish government has supported a parliamentary motion condemning the de facto annexation of Palestinian land by Israeli authorities in what it said was the first use of the phrase by a European Union country in relation to Israel. Irish Foreign Minister Simon Coveney said on Tuesday that the motion brought forward by opposition party Sinn Féin is a clear signal of the depth of feeling across Ireland. The scale, pace, and strategic nature of Israel's action on settlement of expansion and the intent behind it have brought us to a point where it needs to be honest about what is actually happening on the ground. It is de facto annexation, he said. Uh, Coveney continued, quote, this is not something that I, or in my view, this house says lightly. We are the first EU state to do so, but it reflects the huge concern that we have about the intent of the actions and of course their impact, uh, end quote, if passed. The amendment would require the Irish government to expel the Israeli ambassador and to impose economic, political, and cultural sanctions against Israel. Most countries view settlements in Israel, uh, view settlements Israel has built in territory captured in the 1967 war as illegal and an obstacle to peace with the Palestinians. Kobni, who has represented Ireland on the United Nations Security Council in debates on Israel in recent weeks, had insisted on adding a condemnation of recent rocket attacks on Israel by the Palestinian group Hamas before Hamas, excuse me, before he agreed to government support for the motion. Some of the Irish parliamentarians wore face masks bearing the Palestine flag or of the checkered kafia pattern. Uh, and the latest from uh, Radio Havana Cuba on that issue is that the UN has also criticized uh, Israel for excessive force in their recent war against Gaza. Uh, from LGBTQ Nation, Christian millionaires, including Dan Cathy, an heir to the Chick-fil-A fortune, are behind one of the, quote, most sophisticated dark money operations, in quote, ever seen, to pass anti-LGBTQ legislation and to stop the Equality Act. Chick-fil-A has been assuring customers for nearly a decade that it has stopped donating to anti-LGBTQ causes, only to be caught doing so time and again. Now, the fast food chain's billionaire co-owner is using the company's profits to fund hate groups that are passing anti-transgender bills all over the country and a campaign to stop the Equality Act from becoming law. A new report from the Daily Beast exposes the operation being run through the National Christian Charitable Foundation, the sixth largest charity in the U.S. The donors, the group's donors include some of the wealthiest social conservatives in the country, like Chick-fil-A CEO and Chairman Dan Cathy, former Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos Family Foundation, Hobby Lobby, and the Anschutz family. The report comes as the Equality Act stalls in the Senate. The Equality Act would add sexual orientation and gender identity to existing federal civil rights legislation. It polls well. 77, uh, excuse me, 70 percent of voters say they support it in a poll this past March, but it's still far from getting close to the 60 votes necessary in the Senate to pass. That the bill hasn't passed after being introduced in Congress in some form for decades has been something of a, of a mystery. And there's more to that article. Again, that's from LGBTQ Nation. Dot com. Now, this also from Radio Havana, Cuba. Ex-President Trump's... Oh, you know, actually, I think you have a headline that you would like to do before this last one. Um, you're, you're working on something over there. So we'll, yeah, I'll I was going to say, I'm working on a little technical issue. Ah. <laughs> well, while Teresa uh, dishes out all of the, the latest and, and greatest of, of the news and the whatnots, I'm sort of behind the scenes trying to figure yeah. out our new world in our uh, YouTube. <laughs> the better world life. is minus the gremlin that you're trying to chase right now, okay? <laughs> yes. 
All right, well, then I'll just do this. So Ex-President Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, has called for a military coup d'etat to overthrow the U.S. government, similar to the February coup in Burma that killed hundreds of people. Michael Flynn is a former U.S. Army general who was pardoned by Trump for lying to the FBI. He was speaking at a pro-Trump conference recently held in Dallas and convened by QAnon conspiracy theorists and other Trump supporters. And speaking for myself, uh, QAnon is a huge tendency within the Republican Party right now, and the Republicans have been very careful to include them and not to antagonize their bizarre beliefs. Uh, returning to the article, Flynn fielded a question from an audience member who identified himself as a U.S. Marine. The audience member asked, quote, I want to know why what happened in Myanmar can't happen here. Um, and uh, actually, and that's the end of the quote, but he actually said Minamar because he's a conservative. Anyway, Michael Flynn answered, quote, no reason. I mean, it should happen here. No reason, right? That's right, end quote. Michael Flynn now denies he was endorsing a coup, uh, but he affirmed that he strongly believes that Donald Trump won the election and that the Electoral College vote, uh, that he won the election and the Electoral College vote and should be president instead of Joe Biden. And... Um, Speaking for myself, I think this falls in dog whistle territory in which a demagogue like Flynn says one thing in a forum where it is clearly celebrated and then takes a straight face denial to the outsiders like you and me. Uh, but he knows his statement rings true with his supporters. It's very much a Trump move. Uh, meanwhile, Trump himself is promoting the idea that he will be reinstated as president by a coup that will take place in or before August of this year. And uh, this is something that I want to talk uh, with you about yeah, this also, is I mean. I, this is actually I think one of the biggest stories of this week. Um, it kind of falls in step with what you were saying last week about picking up on the fact that there are a lot of people in this country that are ready to go, that are ready for a civil war, that are trying to bring it on. And when I hear that ex-resident Trump is saying he's about to be reinstated. Uh, in step with uh, Flynn's comments this weekend at a QAnon conference. Now, again, let's not, it wasn't just like he said this sort of offhandedly at the supermarket, right? Yeah, it's a He said this at a QAnon conference, and we have just found out that uh, firmly 15 to 20 percent of adult Americans believe in QAnon. It's not just like a laughable, uh, joke. It's not just like, oh, maybe there's something to it. There's 15 to 20 percent of adult Americans that believe in this hogwash, right? And so they're going to be really easy to stir up if they decide to go for the Civil War. And really, what do they have to lose? They are looking at, um, you know, the the voter suppression acts. Uh, show you exactly how scared they are. They know that they don't have majority uh, popular support in this country. They know that basically what they what they have are sort of a, a strong um, plurality of people that are very very easy to manipulate and to manipulate mostly in fear tactics. And so that's fifteen to twenty percent is a, is actually it's a huge amount when it comes to believing something that off base and that dangerous, right? And so they're easy to manipulate and easy to whip up into uh, <clears throat> into a civil war, into, uh, and, and that, make no mistake, that's what all this culture war uh, hogwash, I'm gonna keep saying hogwash, because you know I used to say malarkey, mm -hmm. and then Biden said malarkey, and now I feel like I can't say that anymore because it's relegated to Biden speak. <laughs> So hogwash, we'll crust, say pish posh. Crusty things. Horse muffins it is. Pish posh. Uh, but anyway, this this total crap, right, that has been going on. And so uh, that, you know, call it Dr. Seuss or, uh, you know, the potato uh, toy, uh, plastic face thing, whatever. You know, it's like we have all of these incursions of uh, – this, these false senses of outrage, and that is uh, to distract from the actual problems of the country and the fact that uh, the GOP is not about supporting the people, is not about uh, uh, actually making sure things are improving or getting better in any kind of way. They are about serving uh, the elite, and that's what they keep trying to do. They know they can't do that. 
uh, with without um, uh, crushing uh, democracy, right? Without uh, the the voter suppression acts and without these um, uh, stirred up uh, senses of of outrage. What do I want to call them? Without the without the the culture wars that they keep feeding. Well, this this implies violence, and the problem is uh, this violence is dangerously credible given the historic and social context. In the first place, uh, Flynn is a very recent ex-general. Um, he has he has supporters within the Pentagon, and we know within the context of the January sixth event that there was quite the hesitation. There were people, and there were people in the American secret police agencies. Um, there were people in the uh, in the Capitol Police, there are people at the Pentagon who were very clearly waiting to see how things worked out uh, when, when the attempt was going through. And we need to be clear among ourselves, uh, frankly, as leftists, uh, not to forget that that wasn't just a riot. That was an attempt to stop the, the counting of the electoral votes, which is how we select the president in the United States. It was an attempt to end democracy because once you've actually you know, jumped up and, and forced your way into the process and, you know, the votes just don't matter, then that's the end of it. And they got very close to that. So in this historic context, we have Trump, the ex-president, saying he expects a coup by August. And he won't say coup. He says he expects to be reinstated, but there's only one way to be reinstated, you know. And, and reinstatement is a trending right. phrase. Reinstatement is, is on Twitter right now. If you use the hashtag, you'll find it. And uh, so you have 70% of Republicans thinking that he actually won the election, and they and they are very much outraged about this. Uh, they have convinced themselves that somehow 7 million people's votes didn't matter and that they won the election. And, you know, what they're really saying, and they won't admit even to themselves in, in terms of conscious thought, is they're saying that uh, brown people don't matter. Uh, brown people are part of the electorate now. Uh, together with the coalition, the Democrats represent a majority. They cannot accept this, will not accept this, and they want to rule from an apartheid state. So to make the apartheid state, they need a coup, um, and they've got two. They've got two methods going forward. One of which is to restrict voting altogether, with all of these uh, bills going through uh, the state legislatures, and especially the Republican-controlled state legislatures, uh, restricting voting in various ways targeted at people of color. That's what they want uh, in the long term going forward to restrict the ability to, you know, vote out this coalition of the super rich and the super stupid. Sorry, but that's the way it is, isn't it? And uh, I mean, there's no way, other way to describe QAnon, but uh, bizarre and crazy, I suppose you could say. The credibility of this, I, I just want to say that I am concerned about this. This is dangerous. We don't know what's happening behind the scenes. We don't know who's contacting who. But when we look at January 6th, we know that uh, there are people who are very close in the military uh, who were in on this, uh, who were talking to each other about uh, believing that it was legitimate, and uh, it's not over yet. They still want to they still want to end democracy. The Republicans at this point want to end democracy because it's not going to go well for them. They know this. Demographically, it's not going to change. Uh, white people are not, I mean, you know, conservative evangelical white people are not a majority anymore. Uh, they're they are quite the focused block. They have political power. They have a lot of political power uh, even now, but they want it all. Uh, they don't want uh, coalitions. They certainly don't want people of color like Kamala Harris in the White House. So they're, I, I just getting around to saying there is a terrible danger of an actual coup in the United States between June, July, and August, according to their own words, we need to believe what they're saying because they've doubled down on what they're doing. They're getting better at these little coups, and uh, we need to watch this, and we need to stop it. We need to afford it. Uh, well, those people who are trying to overthrow the government need to go to jail. It's important, you know, to listen to people when they tell you who they are, right, yeah. and to believe them. And we saw this in the January 6th uh, uh, insurrection in the Epiphany uh, Putsch, as Teresa dubbed it. And no one else. <laughs> I, know. I loved it. I kept echoing it. I hope I felt it caught on. Sorry, my allergies. <clears throat> Anyways, all that said, <clears throat> in the we saw that in in January, leading up to that, there was so much public chatter 
about uh, what they were planning to do. As somebody who is on Twitter in not a all day, every day kind of way, but I watch Twitter and I follow accounts of anti-fascists. Uh, and, and I saw uh, clearly that they were planning to throw down like they did on, on January. So if I can pick that up in casual Twitter chatter, um, you know, how it is that those uh, uh, security forces that could stop the thing uh, didn't. Oh, wait, no, they did. They just weren't listened to. No, they were listened to by this person, but not by. Oh, but it was all confused. And there's so much of it anyway. And how well were they to know? Right. What I'm saying is none of that's credible. And so uh, we know that they said they were going to do this thing and they did this thing. Now we see that they are really leading up to doing something. Clearly, they're going to try something again. So it's important to be aware. It's important to, um, to make sure that we are watching and listening and paying attention and not letting other people uh, define what reality is. Um, because now what we have is the uh, GOP uh, redefining reality and saying that January 6th, of course, was not at all uh, anything like an insurrection. And, and uh, that whole whataboutism, if we, if we uh, you know, look at January 6th, we'd have to look at all of the other things that have happened in the last yeah, year. Like, what about the Norman invasion? <laughs> you know? Nothing's been done about that. I've, I've been wondering about the Norman invasion for quite some time now. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't so well about the Roman invasion in 64 AD either. I think we you should check that out. You're a Bodica supporter. I am a Bodica supporter from way back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Teresa hit the nail on the head earlier when she said that the, uh, the putsch on the 6th was, of course, uh, timed to interfere with the election uh, and to stop the democratic transfer of power. None of the other... Uh, uh, protests, actions, uh, marches, and or riots. Nothing else did that, right? Any of the marches uh, for social justice, any of the actions around anti-racism or anti-fascism that have happened in this last year, absolutely none of that was aimed at stopping the democratic transfer of power. <coughs> so no, that, because in fact we so that is actually just just to, to finish that thought, sorry about the cough, uh, but to finish that thought, at the, at the very basis, whenever anyone is trying to throw up that false equivalency, just tell them that. That is that is the ultimate answer. It's like, no, these things are not the same. One is trying to affect change uh, by putting pressure on, on policymakers uh, to say the people are sick of being killed by the police. Uh, we demand an end to uh, this racist system, an end to this racist system. Uh, and, and we, uh, you know, want uh, civil rights uh, reinstated in this country. We want to uh, stop the new Jim Crow. We want to do all of these things different then we want to stop the democratic transfer of power and interfere with uh, democratic elections yeah, in this it, country it, because our guy lost. Yeah, it's that That's context. Different. Again, it was like if you and I say we want a revolution, what we mean is we sit down on the streets or, or strike at the workplaces or whatever till we get our way. And it means something rather vague. It does not mean that we have, like Trump and Flynn, uh, a cadre of heavily armed troops. Uh, we don't know the, extents of, the extent of it, but we know that they exist. We, they have militias. Uh, the three percenters backing them up, and and uh, as it's coming out in the uh, the trials of the militia members, uh, they were very organized and very much used their military training to assault the Capitol. Um, and we don't have a president uh, who commanded those people and still has fanatic loyalty with, uh, and including with some very severely deluded people. We don't have. That context, when we say we want political change, it means something entirely different. And I was say, we were talking about this. And it's like I think we were saying I, I think maybe the the corporate media particularly simply has the habit of not thinking of uh, of right wingers as capable of doing something illegitimate in terms well, of we saw that uh, power. we saw that with with Ron Johnson's comments right uh, where he was on Fox. Had to be Fox, right? No, who else would talk to that guy? Um, we we saw him talking about how he wasn't afraid, not even for a minute, because these were regular American loving 
folks that were storming the Capitol. Uh, he wasn't afraid. Now, he says he might get in a little trouble for saying this. <laughs> but if those folks looked like, you know, those BLM protesters or those Antifas, then he might have gotten a little nervous. But but he knew they weren't going to hurt people like him. They were regular Americans storming the Capitol that day. That's Ron Johnson. That's one of our senators, right? Yeah, he said that with his mouth. Yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> Amber Ruffin, if, if people don't know who Amber Ruffin is yet, please get to know Amber Ruffin. She's a comedian, and I love her. Perhaps um, this is my first effort to say, Amber Ruffin, I love you. Um, so <laughs> she... <laughs> I had a segment a couple weeks ago about politicians that showed their whole ass. And uh, she offered up Ron DeSantis uh, as uh, her latest example of a politician that showed his whole ass. And, and I agree, absolutely. But I also feel we should throw that, that into the mix. Okay, so go ahead. Well, um, I, I feel like we've uh, discussed that issue. And yes. I'm, I'm ready to turn to... Uh, anti-abortion uh, legislation to anti-LGBTQ yeah. legislation, if you are. Sure, sure. Um, I want to, there's a couple of things. Um, so it's the beginning of June. And in the beginning of June, the country suddenly is just plumb full of rainbows, right? <laughs> Doo -doo. Am I shimmering enough? Yeah, you're shimmery. Um, I'm not complaining about the country... Uh, suddenly being plumb full of rainbows. <clears throat> I came out over 40 years ago. I came out when I was 12. And I welcome the rainbow explosion every year because that didn't happen in 1978, right? When I was 12, that didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> and actually, you know, when I came out, the the awareness of the LGBTQ world most of those initials uh, didn't happen yet, actually. We just talked about gays and lesbians. We didn't even talk about LGB yet, not in 78. Uh, and, and really, my awareness of, uh, of queers was, uh, by and large, because Anita Bryant was leading a crusade to uh, tell us that we were evil and you know probably deserved to die. Um, in between squeezing oranges and selling orange juice. Uh, that was her big thing. And that was really what brought to consciousness that queers existed. I haven't heard that name for a while. I know, right? Um, she has just burned into my consciousness forever uh, because of that, because of the timing, because I was discovering my queer self while she was leading her crusades. So I welcome the rainbow explosion. I do. Um, and I welcome this sort of uh, a broad-based support, like, hey, rainbows, we're all happy and unified, and we support love is love. <laughs> love is love, y'all. Uh, but if only there was actual broad-based support to back up the corporate rainbow explosion, I would love it even more. Um, we've made a lot of gains in the 40 years. I'm not going to, I'm not going to naysay it, but... I do want to check this out, right? This year in 2021, states have introduced more anti-trans bills than in any other legislative session. Amid uh, the cries of celebrate you, love is love, uh, LGBTQ ally, um, you know, all of that, the community is totally under attack and people need to know that. Uh, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance going on for me because as much as I love to party, I'm feeling more like Stonewall was a riot for a reason, and that reason was not to become a niche market, right? So by mid-March of this year, 82 bills had been introduced during the 2021 legislative session. Uh, this surpasses the previous record of 79 anti-trans bills from last year. Uh, so, Florida has become the largest and most recent state to impose a ban on transgender women and girls in school sports. Uh, that would be Governor Ron DeSantis showing his whole ass yet again, signing the bill on the first day of Pride Month. Because timing, right? And the smirk on his face as he signed it with a little girl sitting next to him. On Fox News. I mean, he goes straight up full demagogue. You just want to... 
vomit launch. Anyway, at least six other states uh, with Republican governors have passed similar laws. And the ACLU's Chase Stringlio notes more anti-trans bills have become law in 2021 uh, than in the previous 10 years combined. So think about that while the rainbows are exploding all around us. And really speak out for trans rights. Um, I think a lot of folks are like, oh, well, gays and lesbians have achieved and, you know, stuff. We don't discriminate anymore. But when it comes to gender queers, non-binary folks uh, and trans folks, the discrimination, social discrimination uh, targeted for violence and, um, and uh, legal discrimination um, is still huge. It's still huge. So um, let's see, where am I going with this? Uh, I want to say these bills are not addressing any real problem. We've mentioned this on the program uh, before. They're not uh, being requested by constituents. There's not hue and cry from, uh, you know, Sally and Dave down the street. What about the babies? No, it's not actually grassroots at all. Rather, it's an effort uh, being driven by national far-right organizations who are attempting to score political gains uh, by sowing division and hate. And really, again, uh, drumming up the culture war. And the culture war feeds the civil war. These things are all of a piece. And you could imagine if a coup were to go forward, can you imagine the repression that would be pushed forward? But that's, I mean, in Oregon, just in the last, I think in the last year, <clears throat> It ceased to be legal to kill trans women if you had sex with them. If you had sex with a trans woman and you discovered she was a trans woman, then you could say, oh, my God, I've had a gay panic and kill the trans woman and your sentence would be strongly reduced. It wasn't considered trans -panic defense. a full homicide. Yeah, yeah trans panic defense. So just go ahead and kill her. Um, so I can also, uh, going on to say, uh, Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves signed a bill targeting trans athletes. And uh, Reeves actually signed that bill saying that they only signed it because they had to do something about President Biden's executive order on LGBTQ rights, which Reeves asserted encourages transgenderism amongst young people. That's a weird thought. I mean, that's... that's Isn't a, it? That's well, you know what it reminds me of? What it reminds me of is uh, when in the 80s, uh, to, to strike down anti-gay legislation was to encourage kids to be gay. Yeah, and, like, like they're just waiting to be gay? And the legislation is the only thing that stops them. And that is exactly what I'm seeing reflected in these words here. It's like kids are just like, It's because being queer wait. is so... Attractive? Fantastic. And I'm going to say <laughs> it is, actually. <laughs> um, being queer is fantastic. But honestly, I, I don't think that sexual orientation and gender identity is actually formed because you yeah, think something's really cool. It's an innate thing. It's like, yeah. when did you know you were straight? Yeah, it's another anti-science weirdness thing. I mean, like right. I was going to say, in Scotland right now, there's a, a big proof problem because uh, some woman, actually a TERF, who identifies as a TERF, uh, has uh, put out a photograph of a noose uh, using ribbons that signify something or other. And uh, so she is, uh, she's screaming that she is, she put it out on Twitter and now, and that broke a law in Scotland. So now they're saying that, oh, she's being uh, silenced by the LGBTQ community. I don't think so. <laughs> if you make a threat, that's not the same as saying, you know, I am opposed or I have this idea and that. And one of the things she uses to justify her hatred is the idea that her autistic children are particularly susceptible to being turned into trans gender people. How's that work? It doesn't. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It's just a weird idea. It's That's a like weird idea. Not. And yeah. this is apparently has currency in Scotland at the moment. Well, okay. Amongst, amongst turfs. I know <laughs> nothing. <Scotland>. Hey, wow. <laughs> wow. Let's let them and learn. They claim that they are being absolutely silenced because they you know, can't threaten trans women. <laughs> so, okay. There you have it. Yep. Um, so, what else am I going to say here? Um, yeah. So Reeves, weird assertion by Reeves, encouraging transgenderism amongst our young people. Uh, Biden's order, of course, does not actually encourage people to uh, be any specific gender identity. It does, however, uh, put federal government um, 
in opposition to any anti-LGBTQ legislation. Um, so Mississippi's new law, uh, which again discriminates against trans women and girls, uh, goes into effect on July 1st. South Republican, I'm sorry, South Republican, South Dakota Governor uh, Republican Kristi Noem said that she'll sign a similar bill into law. She's already signed a religious freedom bill that civil rights groups say, say enables discrimination by individuals and businesses citing religious objections to the LGBTQ plus folks, members of minority faiths, and others uh, who may be on the outside of um, Christianity. In Tennessee, Governor Bill Lee signed a bathroom bill into law which denies transgender students access to the bathroom and locker rooms consistent with their gender identity. The human rights campaign says that the bill further discriminates against trans students and opens public schools up to legal consequences if students believe that they have had to share a sex segregated space with a transgender student. Meanwhile, President Biden issued a proclamation recognizing June as Pride Month and vowed to fight for LGBTQ rights. What is it with Republicans in bathrooms anyway? What is it with Republicans and sex? You know, they're a little obsessed. I'm just gonna say it's been that way ever since I've uh, been aware. And the, it's like the more conservative, uptight and repressed you are, the more focused you are on sex. Check out the Victorian era. Um, okay, so all of these things. Um, Give me that cognitive dissonance for the rainbow explosion of June, right? Uh, and here we are. We are. This is this is June fourth, isn't it? As of tomorrow, we will have lived together for like twenty seven years. Um, it's dang near our anniversary. Happy anniversary, Thag. Thank you, Og. Um, um, I want to thank you for loving me and and for recognizing my trans and intersex qualities and loving them. Yeah. 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 Loving you right back. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it's uh, you know, I guess I'm saying that because we're queer. We're we're uh, you know, obviously queer, and I think it's important as we go forward looking at this anti queer legislation, uh, and and actually looking at how it intersects. John uh, actually up here makes a point in the comments. Uh, that I was going to uh, get around to making next. And that is the voter suppression bills, the anti-choice uh, bills, forced birth bills, uh, and the anti-LGBTQ legislation. All of these things are really um, uh, being focused right now. And he says, you know, perhaps it's the last ditch efforts of a dying beast. Um, perhaps that's it. But right now it seems like there's an all out is this the civil war? Is this the just trying to consolidate whatever power because they realize they're on the way out? They don't have much to go on. Yes. What is going on with, you know, the the whole anti-choice, uh, forced birth, anti-queer? Uh, we're how is this all connected with the with the voter suppression? Because it's it's the same people that are doing it. Patriarchy, yeah. yeah. anti-femininity. Femininity is a threat. Well, that's not the voter suppression, but but okay, I do definitely agree that the um, anti-trans and the uh, anti-choice bills are totally related. They're totally tied, and that is the patriarchy. Um, patriarchy does not want to see beyond the gender binary. That makes things very, very complicated for the patriarchy. Um, and the patriarchy sure as hell doesn't want rights for uh, for women uh, sovereign over their bodies uh, or trans people in general. Um, so the patriarchy definitely uh, is large and in charge there. I also do want to mention about abortion uh, rights and um, access. Uh, and that is... That's the other uh, legislation that is going to town. By the end of the 2021 session, um, Arkansas had passed 20 abortion restrictions, 20 abortion restrictions in one legislative session. That actually gives Arkansas the ignoble distinction 
of tying with Louisiana's record of the most abortion restrictions in a single legislative session. Uh, and that was passed in 1978. So it took a while to get up to 20 abortion restrictions passed in a single legislative sessions, but Arkansas, you managed. Get on ya. Among the legislation is a near total ban that Governor Asa Hutchinson signed into law in March. I remember speaking about that uh, back when we had a live stream on Facebook. Uh, this ban would prohibit abortion in nearly every case and impose criminal penalty, penalties on doctors and healthcare workers who provide abortion care. The ACLU is challenging the legislation on behalf of Little Rock Planned Parenthood and other organizations. And again, I'm just asking, who is behind the anti-trans legislation? Who's the forced birth crowd? Um, and how do they intersect really with the crowd that wants the freedom to buy guns without any background checks and not wear masks because my face needs to breathe. God made it that way. Well, maybe we should but have seen okay. women don't need to control reproductive rights. Trans don't need uh, access, basic human yeah. rights or access to bathrooms. Uh, uh, people, people with uteruses don't need to uh, have any control over their over their fertility or over their bodies. Um, people controlling their bodies when they're not white men seeking to buy guns or wear not wear masks are suspect. How does this work, Teresa? How if I how about if I frame it all within promoting the hegemony of the uh, Christian evangelical cis white male? All of those things increase the power of some some of them by decreasing the power of other groups and and uh, some of them more directly, but it's all about you know the way things used to be, and it's no coincidence that it's the Confederate states that are the biggest on this sort of legislated repression. I mean that's that's what they're about. Yeah. And slavery was repression through the means of torture. Uh, this is how you get a, a human being to be a slave: is you terrify them with something that's even worse on a constant basis. Can't get away. Kind of get tortured if you don't do it for free. You have to do it for free. Um, mm -hmm. It's an unfortunate fact, but that's how it works. So yeah, that's that's kind of how I frame it. It's <laughs> like uh, white males just don't want to give up. Uh, they don't want to share power. They want to be the power. Uh, Wild Cascadia Radio, Hegelian, Hegelian, dialectic at its most ancient. Thank you. That is actually. And when I say white males, I, I mean these conservative assholes, of course, and not every and not every white male. I think I think we know that. Yeah. Well, I'll just be clear about that. <laughs> Um, you had more to, to say? Okay, another turn then, a uh, different topic. Turn away. Okay, um, I want to say that capitalism is the process of extracting wealth from workers and returning a fraction of the workers' productivity as a wage and accumulating the rest in the hands of whoever had money to begin the process. Often gets confused uh, deliberately in this society, it gets confused with economic activity. I'm against capitalism. I'm not against economic activity, but capitalism also historically is the theft of the rights of all people to the usage and care of the commons. It is the theft of the commons. I can give an example familiar to everyone who travels to the Oregon coast via the roads from Portland. Uh, those roads were often previously lined with trees to hide the devastation of clear-cut timberlands just behind them. This worked for decades to suppress the natural instinct of a traveler to protect the life-giving forest land screened out by the roadside trees. The land had long again, long ago been stolen from indigenous people who protected it for eons and it was parceled out and sold to timber barons. These barons knew that they could count on the remaining road screen trees to hide their true nature, but timberlands have been stripped all over the globe. And the once abundant resource has become scarce so that people will even make jokes about their investment with a few planks of lumber. You can make a lot of money from a tree right now, a lot from a big tree. And so the private landowners on the way to the coast have given in to their greed and they're cutting down the trees by the roads. So the travelers can now see the devastation that the trees once hid. And I could describe it, but I could also say just um, head on down to the coast 
down Highway 26 from Portland, and it is shocking what you will see. It's easy to see how the sun dries out the land when the canopy is gone, making it all the more prone to wildfire as the slash is left laying to dry to the tune of hundreds of tons per acre. The slash burns fast and hot, and once it gets going, it threatens standing trees. Aerial photography also proves that areas that have been clear cut are at great risk of landslide. So it is devastation and the timber capitalists don't just steal wages from their workers, they steal oxygen and life and beauty and wildlife away. We legitimize these actions and reverse their impact in political statements saying they are the actions of job creators rather than the depredation of wage stealers. The stories we tell each other are powerful. So now we have a climate crisis and it has been brought about by capitalism. It is the climate crisis has rapidly advanced and indeed has accelerated to the point that we are now seeing more widespread, widespread destruction from wildfires, ecological disasters like fish kills and algae blooms and violent storms of various types. We're also seeing increased discussion of the idea of geoengineering, that is of cooling the planet. And uh, this is a sad turn of events. The, the editors of the science publication Nature write in an article titled, Give Research into Social, in, excuse me, Give Research into Solar Geoengineering a Chance. Uh, quote, clearly there is a long and difficult road ahead, so governments and scientists must continue evaluating carbon capture and other climate strategies that can be used to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They should also explore ge solar geoengineering, they write, which involves altering clouds or adding reflective particles to the stratosphere to reflect sunlight back into space and cool the planet. The effect of such stratospheric injections would be similar to the cooling that happens after volcanic eruptions. Some studies suggest that solar geoengineering could provide much needed short-term relief if global warming becomes unbearable. And I'm very interested to know what you think of this well, uh, of where we're at and what do you think of uh, solar engineering um, in the comments, uh, please fire away. But technical, they write technical, environmental and ethical questions remain, including how to ensure that the cooling works as desired and who decides the setting for the thermostat. And then there are potential knock on effects, which effects which could vary across regions and sectors of society. More research is needed, they write, to understand these issues. Some scientists are vociferously opposed to solar geoengineering which could go awry in unpredictable ways. And once started, it could be difficult to safely shut down. There are also concerns that even a move to research solar geoengineering creates moral hazard, leading to the misplaced confidence and detracting from efforts to rein in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, some who oppose it fear that once research begins, the rollout of the technology will be unstoppable, no matter what the findings. Researchers who study geoengineering counter that the science needs to be understood the world must consider the thorny questions of international governance that would arise if a country moves forward with an ill-conceived program. But researchers have struggled to raise funding, conduct experiments, and address legitimate concerns about their work, end quote. So they're promoting that, you know, this research, not the actual geoengineering, but the research on the possibility. And it concludes that it is unknown whether such approaches are useful. Therefore, some money they think should be spent on research to see how it all play out. I think it will probably shock my friends to know that I think the threshold for a politically viable end time carbon reduction has already passed. I think it must happen. Carbon reduction needs to go forward, but I think that carbon reduction in sufficient uh, quantity to actually stop the disaster is coming. That time has passed. And I say that knowing that as the nature editors point out, even considering that fact weakens whatever collective will there is to stop the carbon economy. But for me, it's just an acknowledgement of the fact the bastards won. One of the more successful efforts of our oil corporation masters was simply denying and, and hiding the monstrous facts of ongoing climate change until it was too late to act on it. But that was on top of mobilizing resentful and frankly stupid conservatives to reject the idea in the first place. Exxon et alia knew um, even that would be insufficient to tamp down the human desire to survive and save our baby's future. So it carefully inserted the idea that stopping climate change was a consumer choice rather than a mass politically enforced anti-corporate action. And this last trick put the nails in the coffin. Notice how in the cities where we approach a post-pandemic state, there's little or no effort to restart mass transportation or to encourage bicycling. We're just going right back to the petroleum economy. Portland has one of the biggest bicycle cohorts in the nation at around 6%, though the national average is well below 1% commuters. And at the previous rate of increase, we can expect cycling to become the majority way of commuting at some point hundreds of years from now. And I say that of sarcasm, of course. Meanwhile, 10% of the remaining redwoods burned up last year alone. 
You can be sure more of them will perish this year. Lake beds have turned to dust in California. Deep lake waters are losing oxygen around the globe. Eight counties in Oregon are in drought. Dryness extends throughout Nevada to the Canadian border. Fire season has started in Oregon with hundreds of firefighters already active and helicopters brought to bear and fire officials are noting that conditions are the worst in 115 years. This is going to be a bad smoky summer. Do you have extra air filtration equipment and power backups? I didn't think so. I don't. You get a little air filtration. But that's just the tip of the uh, melting iceberg. Higher temperatures mean that droughts dry the land, the forest 10% more than before, so the fires are that much worse. One third of heat deaths around the globe are now considered to be caused by climate change. In Miami, where the heat is so bad, the city has hired a full-time heat officer to deal with health crises, infrastructure failures, and deaths. The Army Corps of Engineers is proposing, excuse me, proposing a 20-foot seawall. So much for beach parties and the manatees, they're dying at a record pace. As Narkel and Dumb Wealth points out, quote, UK, US, Canada, Italy, France, Germany, and Japan spent $189 billion to support oil, coal, and gas between January 2020 and March 2021, just a few months. They spent another $115 billion to prop up struggling automotive and airline industries during that time. Despite all the green economy rhetoric, 80% of this money was given with zero environmental conditions, end quote. That's because these governments are composed of and answerable to corporate power. We didn't change that at all over the last generation, and now it's too late. So this brings me back to geoengineering. It seems to me that there is a stark choice between geoengineering and mass death. So I am turning my attention to who does the climate cooling actions and how. Cooperation could make the difference between improved conditions and world war. In any event, geoengineering only reduces the symptoms of global warming without addressing the cause. Would it be enough of a shock? to make people stop corporate oil, and coal, uh, co corporate oil and coal, or are people determined to live or die ruled by the faceless boardrooms of Exxon and Shell? Would it be enough of a shock to see those spider webs, as was predicted uh, by indigenous communities in the United States, to see those spider webs across the sky? Unfortunately, I think the time has come and we're going to have to deal with it one way or another. At this point, I'm trying to deal with it emotionally. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Very interested in what you have to say about it. And you too, what you got to say. Um, about that, you know, uh, not a lot. <laughs> you know? It's a hell of a shock, isn't it? it? Well, you know, but we've known it. It's not really a shock. You and I have been talking about this for 30 years. <clears throat> um, you know, and to, to, it's a little weird, right? And I bet many of our viewers right now also have this experience being Cassandra. You know, to be that person, it's like, hey, Hey, didn't that this sign? Is, this is happening. Look, we're passing the sign that says warning. Did it say bridge out? Hey, uh, driver, that sign. Right, right, right. You know, and so here we are. Um, I don't know. Will geoengineering work? I don't know. Um, does something have to? I hope so. Right? But I, I agree with you. I think we're already past the point of no return when it comes to so many things. So many things. So... Indeed. Indeed. I, I think the first thing we have to do is retain, you know, sadly, retain democratic control, little d democratic control of this nation, because right now there is a coup brewing. And uh, you can bet that that coup and, and that government, the reinstatement of Trump would be uh, an absolute an absolute disaster. Well, I mean, for the on, climate. you know, in the hundred days in the first, uh, you know, three and a half months of the Biden administration, they've actually done some Notable things, you know, uh, that that have uh, gone well for public lands and for the environment. And you know that that has to really chafe the uh, extractor crowd, those that had tied their, their wealth and their existence to uh, taking the last of the Earth's resources and, um, you know, screwing the rest of us. Uh, it's a death cult. Capitalism is a death cult. And make no mistake. I want to make a call for inaction. Um, specifically, if the coup seriously a call for in uh, call for inaction, I want you to be aware of the coup. I want the coup stopped. But if the coup goes forward, I want you and everyone you know ready to stop working. So no, no working, no commuting, no nothing. If there's a coup, just to say, because some people may not have uh, been watching since the very beginning, what you're talking about. Just to back it up there for a second, is uh, the fact that earlier in the broadcast we were talking about information um, around Trump uh, putting out that he's going to be reinstated uh, by the end of the summer. And 
that is coming out at the same time that ex-General uh, Flynn has made comments at a QAnon conference uh, that a Myanmar-style uh, military uh, coup um, is a good thing, is an admirable thing, and, and should be done here. So um, reading those things together yeah. is what Teresa is referring to. And him, him performatively walking that back doesn't work, especially with his hero Trump saying he's going to be reinstated. So there you have it. Uh, it's time for action. It's time to consider uh, a general strike, uh, can, d depending on what goes forward. I mean, I think that it's very hard for the left uh, to actually come up with an answer to the, a thing like a coup. It's like it has to be publicized, it has to be stopped. But that depends on the will of the uh, of the very uh, mainstream, uh, you know, very Frankly, uh, Biden is a very conservative man, um, and he may not be someone who can actually conceive of the danger, uh, just how fraught the situation is with this this threatened coup uh, by Trump. So we don't know that they will actually take the actions to stop it going forward. Uh, might be up to us, and uh, you know, I, I think what we have is inaction. What we have is nonviolence. What we have is a possibility of non-cooperation with the system. Yeah. Make force them to to respect our votes. Non cooperation with the system is actually uh, the ultimate you know uh, power that we have. Um, we it is it is our energy it is our life's blood that causes the gears of industry to turn. So when we deny them our labor, it does bring things to a halt. Now I understand that that's a pretty privileged thing to say, and if you are relying paycheck to paycheck to keep a roof over your head. You know, understand that's the way the system has been designed yeah. to keep you uh, uh, working those three jobs so that you can barely keep the roof over your head. Um, we need to develop mutual aid that has actually come a long way in this last year of the pandemic. Um, we need to keep going with that. Uh, we need to figure out how to support each other. And to the extent possible, uh, we need to not cooperate with a system that is trying to kill us. More? on you for that's, that? That's what I have. And, I have um, a couple. I have one thing I forgot to mention earlier. When you were talking about headlines, uh, there was a piece of news that really caught my eye this week, and I do want to mention it. Uh, and it is about something good that Biden did. It's a bit weird. I feel at times I might just come off as a Biden apologist. I know he's a neoliberal. I know. Um, I know that he is truly problematic in so many ways. And yet... Um, I think maybe I'm still just processing the trauma of the Trump years <clears throat> because the beating stopped a little bit and I'm pretty happy about it. <laughs> that said, um, he did a, He did a good thing. Uh, the Biden administration has now formally terminated the Trump era migrant protection protocols. Um, that was also known as the Remain in Mexico Act of the Trump years. Um, Biden put that on pause in January when he first got in. Uh, to the White House, but um, it was this week that he has actually formally ended that. And why is that important? Well, because uh, the 2019 policy forced uh, almost 70,000 people, uh, asylum seekers, to actually wait in Mexico, uh, often crowded into uh, Ciudad Juarez and Tijuana uh, in very dangerous conditions where they were subjected to uh, kidnapping, rape, murder, uh, just really, you know, you're seeking asylum for a reason. And to be uh, sort of stuck in cities that are becoming more and more dangerous because of these conditions, as well as spiraling poverty, is uh, horrific. It's just horrific. Uh, so they were, uh, nearly 70,000 people were forced uh, to wait in those dangerous conditions while they're making their cases uh, to the U.S. courts. The Biden administration says about 11,000 asylum seekers who were enrolled in the uh, migrant protection pro protocols have been allowed into the U.S. since January. Immigrant rights groups celebrated this news but vowed to hold the administration accountable. The ACLU says that Biden's administration must now ensure that everyone who was subjected to this policy can pursue their asylum claims. 
uh, in the U.S., Biden must also dismantle Trump's other attacks on the asylum system. You know, and I must say that these people are refugees from our corporate climate change, and they're refugees from our war of terror. Yep. Uh, All of the above. We are responsible. And yeah. uh, when I say we, I mean this country is responsible for the misery of those asylum seekers, directly and indirectly. And so uh, we have an obligation morally to take those folks in and to not increase their suffering by concentrating uh, human beings into uh, spiraling chaotic conditions in Ciudad Juarez. It's also demographically stupid. I mean, this nation needs those people. I mean, that's aside from a moral argument. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, goodness gracious, I you know anything else? Uh, I want to thank you for for tuning in here. Uh, and one more thing, then I just wanted to make uh, sure. Yes, you have, okay. Uh, and that is um, intuitive comments. Indeed. So, in looking at uh, what's happening this week, we it does seem like you know here we're, we're in June. The um, there's the celebratory feeling of pride, even if it rings a little hollow and it's just effing weird uh, with the pandemic and with the, the swing to the right in so many ways. It's effing weird. And yet here we are um, feeling it's a, uh, there's a little turnaround. There's a, it, we're heading into summer solstice, which is coming up in three weeks or so uh, on the 20th. And so what I got reading wise this week uh, is a whole lot of good times. Um, I have used the cat tarot. And so we have a card talking about uh, good work being richly rewarded. <laughs> we have um, a card talking about, in fact, that you have done very, very good things and deserve all the belly rubs and all the treats that you could possibly take in. And that we know that things are really, really uncertain and apt to change suddenly. The tower. This is Teresa's least favorite card. Yes. <laughs> I was every, every, ass kicked by the tower. Every time I go to, uh, to my tarot cards, and Teresa's in the room. She's like, you're not going to pull the tower, are you? <laughs> That's PTSD. Tower. That's PTSD, I tell you. <laughs> no. Well, at least it's a cute tower. Yeah, it's Kitty's got cats. But it is, it's a sudden change. It's upheaval. It's all things, you know, nothing is permanent. All things pass away. And sometimes it happens chaotically. <clears throat> but how do we deal with that? Um, we also need to understand that there are really good things happening. And sometimes what we need to do is change our perspective. Uh, the story of this card is that there's a whole lot, whole lot of fun to be had, but this cat doesn't know. It needs to really shift its perspective, like literally turn around, and it too can play. It too can engage in the game. So it that's needs, needs to pause. Oh yes, that's the story. In fact, of uh, the three of wands in the cat tarot. Um, so. Adding that all together, what that means is, um, hey, good, hey, good people, we've done a lot of good work. You have really done a lot coming through this year. Um, <clears throat> it is the expansiveness of summer that is upon us right now. We can um, really look forward to enjoying good times together, but always, always, always know that sudden change is not only possible, but is probable. Um, and that sudden change can be really scary. It can be really upsetting, but it's also probably pretty necessary because we know that we live in a system that is not sustainable. Um, and that it is not sustainable. We shouldn't even try, right? We should not try to sustain this death cult capitalist system in which we find ourselves, the patriarchy capitalist system is trying to kill us, right? Um, we know uh, from the pandemic, uh, the sudden changes that we had to implement last year, the lockdowns, the sudden changing of all the ways that we did so many things. We know that that is stressful to suddenly change many, many things. But we can do it. Um, we should not be rushing to get back to the normal. 
that was um, before those lockdowns started, uh, I think we're squandering huge opportunities to really shift how we've done things. Um, but we have done a lot of good work together and we can uh, really take in um, some self-care. We need to take care of each other and ourselves. We need to accept the fact that there is some goodness in the world and lighten ourselves up. We should not um, give in to cynicism. Cynicism is soul death. Uh, and, and at the same time, be aware, sudden changes will occur. Um, they can be traumatic. They can be upsetting. Um, but again, change our perspectives. Find those that help. Find those that you love. Find family and kin. And keep on keeping on. And that's what we got. I, uh, as it works out, I can't actually read the comments very well, but I, I just saw one that says, are you removing my comment? Well, I'm not. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, <laughs> no is the answer. Much, and I was about to actually write in the comments. No. I wanted, um, no, not at all. Yeah, I wanted to say that I, I very much like the comment. I mean, the I like it that we can get comments. And I, I read them after the fact, generally speaking. We may change to a larger screen at some point so that I can you know, eyeball them, but <laughs> a larger screen. Yeah. It's either that or I have to get up close to this one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, honey. I don't think you should probably try reading them in real time. You just do the talky talky part. I'm still All right. living. I feel good. We, we love you. <laughs> uh, we think that uh, we are probably at the end. It's, a, it's yeah, been huh? an hour we've been chatting with you. Yep. We hope you've enjoyed our, um, our maiden voyage on this, our new YouTube channel. Um, <clears throat> we um, will be putting the sound up on our SoundCloud page. And uh, to let you know, you can follow along throughout the week in the Twitterverse at Bridge Numeral to Utopia. You can also find us uh, on the Instagrams. Um, and that's, uh, you know, this is now dot bridge to a better world. Um, and then, of course, there's our YouTube channel. You're here now, so you know where we are. Yes. Do uh, hit the notification bell. Um, oh, because, yeah. The, uh... Because you never know. We actually have been talking about being more spontaneous as things strike us to share more often uh, with folks. And, and there's so the that, like and subscribe thing, too. Like and subscribe. That's the notification bell. Oh, okay. Yeah. Shows um, I don't know. Well, I think the notification bell might be different. Yeah, like, like this, subscribe, leave comments, you know, all that stuff. Um, we'll get used to the lingo. And thanks thanks very much for being. We'll be back next week, if not sooner. Yes. And uh, I just want to say my love goes out to you and to all the ships at sea. <laughs> <laughs>